Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Lisa Monteja. I am the director of the Vanderbilt Brain Institute at Vanderbilt University. I'm also a professor of pharmacology. And I'm delighted today to moderate a session. This is part of our Lab to Table event that is hosted by the School of Medicine Basic Science. And today we're here to talk about teen mental health cultivating well being. This uh, event is really centered around teens, adolescents. We know that this is a crucial developmental period, socially, intellectually, physically, emotionally, but it's also a time when many teens experience mental health advers adversities. According to the Youth Risk Behavioral Surveillance System of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the number of teens experiencing depression and suicidal thoughts has increased by approximately 40% over the 10 years preceding the COVID pandemic. The pandemic has only exasperated these issues. Today, we will discuss why we've seen such a growth in mental health adversities for teens in the past few decades, what neuroscience tells us about the development of the human brain and the potential for treatment of these disorders, and how this impacts brain development and tactics and treatments that exist for teens to cultivate well being. So, just as a note before we get started, please place any questions you have in the QA at the bottom of your screen. We've also received numerous questions from registration. We're not gonna be able to answer all questions, but we will try to get to as many questions as we can at the end of the moderated session. And so today I'm absolutely delighted uh, to have really three individuals that are working in various aspects of the space in both complementary ways for this discussion. I want to start off first by welcoming Lainey Grace. Lainey, could you please tell us briefly a little bit about yourself? I'm Lainey. Um, I work in the treatment industry. I help um, navigate to get people into treatment. I also am um, on year three of sobriety from a heroin addiction, and I am honored to be here today. We are honored to have you, Lainey. Thank you so much for being here. Um, the next person I would like to introduce is Dr. Kristen Gilliland. She's the Director of Outreach and Advocacy Programs at the Warren Center for Neuroscience Drug Discovery here at Vanderbilt University. Kristen, welcome. Thank you so Let's much. I'm honored, I'm honored yeah. to be here. Yes, and so I, I came to the Warren Center um, as part of sabbatical from Cal Poly San Luis Obispo, where I have been teaching thousands and thousands of students for about 20 years. And uh, what brought me to the Warren Center was to uh, pursue research in the uh, treatment uh, or finding new treatments for schizophrenia, just to treat the symptoms of it. And uh, because, and I did that because my son actually had developed schizophrenia in its late teens. And um, I ended up staying here and I'll be discussing why that's so later. Well, we're delighted you stayed here and we're delighted to have you join us. You. Our third panelist is Dr. Stefan Heckers. And Stefan is an esteemed psychiatrist. He is also the chair and the William P. and Henry B. Test Professor for the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences here at the Vanderbilt University Medical Center. Stefan, welcome. And would you tell us a little bit about you and your area of expertise? Yeah, thank you, Lisa. It's a pleasure to be with you all. And uh, I hope we will have a uh, a good discussion about this topic of teen mental health and how both psychiatry and neuroscience can shed some light on this. I trained as a clinical psychiatrist and also as a neuroscientist and have been very interested in understanding the mechanisms in the brain that go awry, particularly in adolescents and young adults as psychosis emerges, leading to illnesses such as schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. Hey, well, welcome. We are delighted to have you as well. I want to um, kind of start off, since Stefan, you uh, were the last person to really introduce yourself and follow up a little bit on what you just said. And we're going to talk about teens and adversity and really mental well-being. And um, as we're thinking about teens, you know, often we think about, you know, they just, okay, they're on a trajectory to adulthood. But we know that their brains are very different than adults. And so really, what are 
major brain developmental milestones that are happening during adolescence and how could they really impact our mental health? We're going to talk about a lot about adversities, but really as a starting point, what do we know and what are some of the really, as I said, milestones during this period? Why do we see some diseases really start to show at this period? Yeah. Thank you, Lisa. Let me uh, maybe start out with a, a broader overview over what is happening during adolescence as we think about development, not just brain development, but development of the person. Um, adolescence and young adulthood is an exciting period, but it is also a rather stressful period. It is the one period in the life of a person where they move towards independence. So rather relying on the guidance of parents and others, they are figuring out how to establish their own role in this world. And that's a daunting task. It always has been a daunting task. And it has become increasingly more complex to find the place because the world has become bigger and bigger. Within that context, we now need to recognize that, of course, the brains that we use to orient ourselves and find the place in the world is not quite done yet in development at that time period. Uh, we believe that one of the aspects of how the brain is organized, which we, which we would call myelination, which is how the brain connections are ultimately going to be very efficient so that you can quickly engage in a task, that myelination does not really complete until the end of the second decade in life. So basically, as you start to go into the, go into the 20s, um, that myelination pattern starts early on in life, even before birth, and runs its course for 20 years. That's one of the major processes that occurs, which we often use the metaphor of things becoming online or brain regions becoming connected. The brains that we are born with already have all of the different parts and processes, but they are not quite fine-tuned yet, and we have not learned to use them. So over time, with learning, like we learn how to move, we learn how to speak, and we learn how to interact with other people in the world, that process takes 20 years. And it is a period of vulnerability because we need to be flexible. Our brain needs to be able to adapt to various environments. So that requires some give and take within the brain. And that makes the brain also vulnerable to influences that might not be all good. So that's kind of a brief summary of kind of how we need to think about adolescence as the most exciting, but also most stressful period of individuation where a person becomes who they are and that that is governed by our brain completing its development. Thank you. I think that really um, sets a very, very nice tone of what we're talking about and the changes and also the vulnerability during this exciting time. You know, I think if you think about over the last few years, you know, clearly the stress of COVID, the isolation, you know, people have talked a lot about how this has contributed to this increase in um, sort of the teen crisis of mental well-being. However, as I started the intro, we've seen prior to COVID, a good decade before COVID, that there was this increase in teen mental health issues. And so I really wanted to um, ask our panel, um, you know, maybe starting with Kristen, what factors do you believe have really contributed to the significant increase in adversity among teens? I mean, even before COVID. You know, I, I believe with the tremendous amount of distractions that we have now, whether it be phones and our social media, video games, whatever these the children are growing up with, and even as adults, that we don't sit long enough with our emotions to process them. I think that we find ways to escape those emotions. And that's personally what I feel is that we have become a society that is not aware anymore. And there's a beautiful quote that's paraphrased by Lao Tzu that says, if you're anxious, you're living in the future. If you're depressed, you're living in the past. And if you're at peace, you're living in the present. And I think that's one of the issues we have right now is that we're not living in the present moment. 
And um, I believe that that creates a lot of anxiety and, um, and especially with teens, maybe comparing themselves to others when they should really realize that just as they are, they are enough just as they are. And I think that that is a huge uh, contribution to mental illness right now is just comparing themselves to others and thinking they have it made. And um, when actually they have it made themselves, but they just don't know that. That's very beautifully said. Lainey, what would you like to add from your perspective? I really love what Kristen said. Um, I agree with what she said. I, for me, it was lack of identity. Um, I didn't really have a purpose kind of flowing through life. I let everybody else. Um, I really think it's like with social media, with like friends, like a friend group, we don't know who we are yet. So we're letting the world fill us in with who we are. And sometimes that can get really like confusing. It can make you go a certain path. But I think like really strong leadership in teens life is what's needed to overcome that. Like we need to speak like life into them and um, recognize like their qualities. Cause a lot of times, like I said, the world will be friends or social media, they'll, you know, bully kids. Um, so I think it's lack of identity in teens, even though they're still growing, they need something. They need a purpose for something. I always say, find your purpose until your purpose finds you. So I would say lack of identity. Thank you. That's actually very nice. Stefan, would you like to add on this? Because I, I, I do think it's a really interesting question. As you said, we're sort of searching for identity and, you know, the world is becoming bigger and bigger. And how are people, you know, really viewing themselves in it that is it going to continue to contribute to more and more problems in terms of teen mental health? Yeah. So I, I, what Lainey just mentioned very much resonates with me. And I would try to um, kind of send a simple message that the world has become more complex. There are many more answers to the questions and there's little guidance in how to select among all of those possible answers. Compared to maybe a generation ago where the world was not as open, not as accessible on a daily basis. And there was maybe also more of a guiding structure of which choose, which way to choose and which options um, are the right ones for an adolescent. So I would think both of those go together. And the final piece is that we are more willing to talk about mental health issues, the adversity that we're experiencing in the world, but also the challenges, whether it is depression, anxiety, substance use. We are more willing to have a forum like this one to be open about the vulnerabilities, which in the past might not have happened that easily. So we are more willing to reveal the vulnerability without necessarily having more guidance in how to address those questions. No, I think that's really an important point. So following up on that, what do you do as a parent or as a teacher or as a family member, you know, as an aunt or cousin, when you see a teen that's really having a mental health struggle, um, what can you do to really support them and also possible interventions to really try to make a difference? Um, you know, Lainey, you're shaking your head. I'd love to get your thoughts on this, especially from, you know, the trajectory that you described at the beginning. Yeah, so I think um, like how we can help them, how we can pinpoint it, but really just like loving them exactly where they're at. Um, a lot of times, I mean, families are different, right? Like, so I grew up in a family where it wasn't really like overpouring with love. Um, it really, I didn't have anybody to kind of speak life into me growing up. Um, and even after um, when I got sober three years ago, I was still that teenager running around like, who am I? Like, what is all this? So I had to have people in my life to, to speak life into me. So I think just love them exactly where they're at. Um, spend time with them. In a world that's so fast moving today, we don't really spend quality time with people anymore. If we do, you know, we're on, on our phones, like let's take some selfies, something, but I, I think really quality time, maybe even like watching a movie together or going on a hike together, getting outside and really connecting with that person again. Um, just outside of the world and just really listening to them. Listening is big. Um, I always say uh, to people I'm talking to, do you want advice or do you want someone uh, just to listen to you? And whatever they choose, like, let it be that. We don't always have to give advice, but we can always listen and love them where they're at. I think that's very, um, very important. 
Um, Kristen, yes. um, we, um, you know, as colleagues, I know that you recently completed a documentary as a parent, having um, a child that had a mental health issue. And um, I really wanted to know if you want, uh, would talk about this briefly, um, because this is really, as you said, you're embracing a lot of outreach and really trying to talk about mental health challenges where, where people can understand, you know, brain, brain development is different, but also what you can do about it. So could you tell us a little bit more about the documentary and a little bit on your trajectory really in joining us here today? Thank you, Lisa, I'd love to. Um, first, before I forget, because I will, the documentary is screening at the Franklin Theater, if I can say that, um, on Tuesday, yes, August 14th. <laughs> Tuesday, I August I was going to say that at the end, so you beat me to this. <laughs> Perfect. I just always forget that point. But uh, Tuesday, August 15th at 7 p.m., and we have a wonderful guest panel that will follow and addressing teen mental health, too, and uh, it's $15.00. Uh, and it supports NAMI, so the National Alliance on Mental Illness, too, so it will benefit uh, NAMI. And um, so while I was on sabbatical, because when I was doing research in the lab and just trying to find new treatments for um, schizophrenia, uh, and basically the, the symptoms of schizophrenia, I should say, because um, my son, he, when he had uh, the disorder, he actually... He didn't like to take the medication because the medication he was on made him very numb and um, he, he was very creative and he stopped doing what he loved to do. Um, and so he actually would frequently go off of his medication. And uh, when that happened, he would start using other drugs and it ended up that he became addicted to those drugs. And eventually he, um, he died of an accidental overdose at the age of 22. And I knew I was going to do something in his name. And I thought, do I help fight addiction? Do I, you know, maybe work in harm reduction? What can I do to try and help other families so they don't have to go through this tragic and, and heartbreaking loss? But I thought what I can do is I can teach and I can take the research of people who are doing incredible things with, you know, finding out more about the adolescent brain, finding out more about addiction, finding out more about mental health, and put that and teach that to adolescent age children, and teach that to their parents, and put it in a very palatable form to where they can understand it. And I'm doing this instead of using a fear tactic of going in you know, to a school and saying, if you do this, this is going to happen to you. It's like, let's give knowledge and let's give that knowledge with compassion. Let's give um, kids the ultimate uh, or just empowerment to realize that they are walking around with the most amazing supercomputer they will ever own. And that's their brain. And the fact that we don't teach kids, which I know that we, we just, you know, there are resources that are not there, but to teach kids about their brain real time right now, we're learning so much. And if we could bring this to the schools so kids could learn this and, um, and just also learn about um, how they can utilize these incredible developments, as uh, Dr. Heckers said, to their advantage during this time and to build healthy brain connections. Um, into adulthood because no child ever grows up and says, I want to be addicted to drugs when I grow up, or I want to be an anxious or depressed when I go up. And so this film basically touches uh, the mental health issue that's linked to um, maybe going off and, and trying things, uh, substance uses or, or substance use, excuse me, or, or maybe might lead to anxiety or depression later on, just because like when Lainey said, it was kind of finding their identity and they're trying to find it in some way. And this film touches on that um, and, and trying to say that you are enough and then also to teach them about their brain and the power they have during this incredible time of development and then to give them hope, to give them hope and to teach them about awareness and um, just skills, self-confidence, uh, self self-compassion, things like that, to help with their mental health into adulthood. This is my attempt. <laughs> no, and I mean, um, you said that very eloquently. Um, you know, I honestly, I can't even imagine what you've went through and really putting this together to try and advance outreach is really important. Um, 
you know, as a parent, um, let me ask a, a slightly different question to the panel. So we talked a lot about, you know, the world is bigger and how do you find your place? And, you know, no one wants to be addicted. No one wants to have schizophrenia or be depressed. These things happen. And we know that there are clearly genetic components. There's also can be environmental components. You know, as you go home and, you know, with having access to all this information, it become, can become very overwhelming. Hearing about what's going on in the world, hearing about, you know, whatever the situation may be, whether it's climate change, worrying about school safety, worrying about violence in your community. There's a range of topics. And so how do we really separate what's normal anxiety, like fear that we all maybe had growing up of different things that could happen to you versus this sort of overwhelming aspect at times that people are experiencing more and more. Um, you know, Stefan, um, could you maybe weigh in and as, as a psychiatrist, what is your perspective? Um, is this just happening in the teen? Is this also happening in adult psychiatry? We know teens are more vulnerable in many ways, but yeah. I, I'd love to hear your perspective. At the core, of course, the question is, what do we consider to be normal part of the human condition? Yes. How do we handle stress? How do we grieve when we lose a loved one? All of those we should not pathologize. We consider that to be part of being human. But then, of course, there are other conditions and other behaviors and feelings and thoughts that we consider to be out of range of what we consider to be the human condition. And to really decide which one is in, which one is out is not trivial. One really important data point that is lacking is that we do not know how the normal range of behaviors changes over the course of a person's life. I just want to take you back to when you were a child and you went to the pediatrician's office. Every year, he would put you on a scale and he, he would make sure that you would get mapped into a growth curve where you could see what percentile of height and weight you were at at that moment in time. Everybody assumes that that is a really important data point to have because it actually allows us to intervene early and potentially make adjustments. For example, changes in diet, changes in exercise, or even medical interventions. Do we have anything like this for the human mind? Do we have a growth curve that we follow in the person's life every year so that we then have data points at age 5, 10, 15 to say, this child, this young adult might actually run into problems because they're on a growth curve that separates them from where the majority of people are. That's one of the ways to get at your question, Lisa, what do we consider to be normal and what is abnormal? Because if you ask the individual person, you will get very, very different questions. For some people, ideas and thoughts that seem to be perfectly fine to another person seem to be bizarre and completely incomprehensible. But if we had a bigger effort in our medical community to develop these growth curves for the human mind, we would be in a much better position to help parents and ultimately adolescents to give them a sense of where they are and whether interventions would be recommended. So I think, I, I think that's really a very crucial point. I want to take what you said and I want to kind of break it down into um, sort of two parts, if you will. Um, you know, I want to talk a little bit about the mental health aspect, but before we come to that, assuming, you know, the normal stresses, assuming the things what, you know, adolescents go through, how can we really create in our own homes, in our own communities, a more supportive and understanding environment for teenagers, for, you know, those around us that we love. I mean, um, Lainey, I mean, you talked a little bit about your family. And if looking back, um, what would have made it more supportive? Or as you look around in the relationships that you're in, what do you do to try to promote that, especially towards teens? And so that they feel included and know that this is a safe environment. I would say for me growing up, um, how it would have been, how I would have felt more supported is just um, 
like time being there, you know, um, it was, my dad was gone a lot. My mom, um, I don't, it was just, it it was a lot, but I would say like go into different programs, like, Hey, if you can't, um, be there, like maybe get them signed up for different things, like get them out going out of the house. Um, but I think what's really cool is like Kristen's film, what she speaks on, she's equipping the kids. So it is going to parents too, but it's equipping the kids. And we, that is something what we need for the youth. I mean, she takes, um, she teaches about like mindfulness, like what are you partnering with? Like, what are you constantly telling yourself? And I think there, there's really, it's, uh, there's power in your words and in your thoughts about yourself. So I think that would have helped a lot. Um, just knowing that like, Hey, you are enough. Um, and just getting your mind to change like the, it also, I'm not a scientist. So just the brain waves that connect and how they reroute over time was really powerful. Um, for me to watch that and see that. And then looking back when I was younger. So I think equipping the kids with information, with knowledge, because sometimes parents can't be the ones that do it. And, um, you know, just having outreach um, programs, something that's fun, but light, I think getting kids involved into something that's really, really heavy, like kids are meant to have fun, they're meant to figure out who they are, you know, so just light, like, I think that's what they need is lightness and just being equipped with the knowledge. No, no, that's, that's very insightful. Kristen, why don't we follow up? Because again, the documentary has been working in this space, trying to empower and educate. What are your thoughts on this? So my, my thoughts are, um, I, I'm going to tell a story of a, a family that lives down the street from me. They're amazing and they've got five children. And I was so shocked to hear that every Sunday they have a family meeting. They all sit down as a family and no phones can be around. And for an entire hour and a half, they discuss how their week was and the like their highs and lows, what happened, what was great, what was not great. And everybody is not allowed to, um, you know, interject when they're speaking this. And I think there's so much you said is what Lainey is saying to be heard and mm-hmm. to, to feel supported, to feel like you have somebody there. And it's just that, that feeling of, oh, I'm not constantly checking my phone or I've, you know, I'm not really listening to you, but truly listening and asking questions and, and finding out how you're really doing. Like, how are you really doing? And finding, always going to try and find help. If someone needs to get help, try and find help for them and just make sure that you keep finding uh, or you keep trying until you find a good fit for your child. I mean, that is really key. It's just always getting professional help is very, very key, especially when they, uh, they need it and finding someone who works with them and that they like to go to and, and feel uh, comforted by. Yeah, no, no, I think that's really important. And so with that, um, you know, as we talk about safe environments, feeling included, you know, building stronger foundations, if you have a team dealing with mental health challenge, um, you know, severe mental health challenges, it can be a very confusing landscape. And so Stefan, I wanted to kind of, you know, I'm sure you filled many calls at times from people not sure what to really do and people reaching out. So what is your advice if you have um, a teen that, again, having a mental health challenge and a parent really not knowing what are the next steps? What's your yeah. advice? Well, not a, not a simple answer here. It really depends on the child and it depends or the adolescent and it depends on the issues that are the child or adolescent are dealing with. Anxiety or depression are quite different from substance use, are quite different from a developing psychotic illness like schizophrenia. So it really depends on what the individual needs. Um, Second, the most important point for our approach to mental health issues is the ability to engage with the services that are available. It turns out that that is the biggest barrier for people to get treatment. It's not that there are no treatments available. It is that there is a reluctance to even ask for it and an even greater reluctance to stay in treatment once it has been offered. So the ability to engage, not to feel ashamed, to be willing to accept that and say, I need the help either from a counselor or from a psychiatrist with medication, or maybe even in a crisis with a hospitalization that the person is able to see the value of this 
is not going into hiding and ignoring it because it's stigmatized. So we really have those issues for medical conditions. If you play football and you hit your head and you pass out, nobody takes issue with that you need to see a physician to make sure that you didn't hit your head. But if you get depressed or anxious or start using drugs, then people don't know whether that immediately requires the medical attention that you would get for a so-called physical condition. So these simple dichotomies, it's the body or it's the mind, still are holding us back. And it makes it literally impossible for the young person to engage. If we could tackle that problem, the health of this nation would be dramatically improved. We also need better treatments, I grant you that. We need better psychotherapy and clearly better pharmacological intervention. But if we had the ability to apply all of the evidence-based approaches we already have, we would be much better off. So that's why what Kristen is doing with psychoeducation, with putting out a documentary, and what Lainey is doing as a peer, that she can talk one person to the other, saying, I've been there before, I have been in your shoes, is absolutely crucial because it lowers the threshold. It makes it more likely for a young person to engage and stay in treatment. No, that's very well said. I want to, um, there were several points that you meant in there. I want to follow up, Lainey, with you. Um, how, in terms of navigating the system, you've went through, as you said, um, addiction and recovery. What was your, can you tell us just briefly about your path and about the services and how you really were able to find the strength? Because this took a tremendous amount of strength to really move forward. So I, I really like what Stefan hit on the uh, the shame. I think like shame and guilt played a huge factor into um, like hiding the addiction for a really long time. Um, because, you know, to your loved ones, to your friends, like you have to be a certain, you have to be a certain picture. And if you don't fit that, you're like, oh, maybe I disappointed them. So the guilt and the shame, like when I speak to other people that are going through addiction, that's the first thing that I tackle. Um, but when I, um, I went to many different treatment centers. So seven, I went to seven treatment centers. Seven was my last one. Um, but thankfully, um, there's a lot in the county that I live in. The recovery community is really huge. So it wasn't hard um, finding treatment. Um, I do think that treatment is important if you are struggling with addiction just to pull you away from the world. I think that was the, the number one thing that I needed. Um, but there are even there are addiction treatment centers all over. So I don't really think the access to get into treatment is hard, whether you have um, like private insurance or state insurance, it's still available to everybody. But I think um, when I first went into treatment, well, before I went into treatment, I called the treatment center. I was in a really the lowest point of my life. I, I just had, um, you know, lost custody of my son. It was really, um, it was really tough. So I was like, enough is enough. Like I'm going to do this for him. Um, but the lady that I talked to on the phone, um, she just gave me so much like encouragement. So I think that was the number one thing that I needed. Like, hey, you know what? You're here, but you're not going to be here anymore. So she gave me the solution that I was looking for and did it with encouragement and says, hey, I've been here before. Like this said earlier, um, sharing like testimonies, um, going to the other person, hey, I've been here before and here's the way out. So I think that was an important part of my journey. Um, I believe um, also women in my life, um, finding the same person, um, the, the same sex person to speak with about the things that really trouble you, especially um, early on in recovery as well, and just letting them pour into you. But I, um, I do believe that it was just the encouragement and um, it was a beautiful path to get there. I yeah, know, we're so proud of you. And I have to say, you know, as you said, you went through seven treatment centers. There was no yeah. one size fits all. It's no. really trying to find, you know, what works for you. Kristen, you're yeah. on the educational side of this. Can you tell a little bit more about, you know, you've done this beautiful documentary, but about other initiatives that you're using and approaches towards really educating people and reducing the stigma of mental illness? Yeah, the, what my motto is, is brain health equals mental health. And so really trying to, um, to, to go out there and, and to show the beauty, as I said, of our brain. I mean, we really, it, 
it's incredible that we go through life and we go in and we, you know, have the cardiology, we're worried about our heart, our lungs and all these things, but nobody really like, you know, Dr. Hecker says, nobody's really going in and measuring how is, how's your brain doing right now? But um, my, what I'm trying to do is really to use um, education to teach kids and excite them about mm -hmm the beauty of their brain and how malleable it is during adolescence and just the power that they have and 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 really tell them that you know at this point given that there are no other underlying conditions that they have the power to become who and how they want to be as an adult you know you really just to give them that power that it, i always like when you say that you know, you, when you react to somebody who, who gets under your skin, it's like, you know, you, you can't change other people's behavior, but you can surely change the way you react to it. And so really trying to teach kids that you have a moment, let's slow down for a second and have a moment to breathe and decide how you will react to a situation. And really what you're doing is training your brain, right? I mean, working on that plasticity just by taking that step back and trying to teach them that you have that power. And everybody has that power. <laughs> well, I think that's very important. I want to come back to something else that you said, Stefan. Um, you know, and that is that we need better treatments. And I think, you know, I've really thought about this question quite a bit. Why do people not talk about mental illness the way they would talk about a physical ailment? You'll hear people say, you know, my parent has a heart condition, but rarely do you hear someone say, my parent is schizophrenic. You know, we all know that there's a stigma. And one question I know I've really juggled in my mind is, are we going to continue to battle this? Is, the, is one of the key aspects really treatment? Once we have better treatments, then people will be more open to say, you know, my mother had schizophrenia as an example, but she's doing so much better. Her treatment, she responded. Or having addiction, like with better treatments, maybe that may help. I don't know. It's more of a philosophical question per se. But I wanted to get your thoughts on um, really where you think treatment and aspects in your area of research of more schizophrenia, as well as, you know, if you could also talk about the intersection of drug abuse and schizophrenia a little bit, and where you see treatments currently at and really what's needed. Yeah, well, there are a lot of questions. Yeah, let me briefly address the first one. And of course, uh, you, Lisa, are one of the leading pharmacologists really to spearhead our effort to develop new treatments. And I can grant you that in the history of psychiatry, the most impactful intervention that has helped us think differently about mental illness was treatment. In fact, we have eradicated various mental illnesses that we now understand to be medical conditions that we are now preventing. A lot of infectious diseases, for example, that in the past had run its course and literally destroyed the brain uh, are not there anymore because we have antibiotics. Uh, I do predict that although Alzheimer's disease and dementia is a very daunting challenge, that we will make significant progress and we will be able to intervene early. So not just treat a person who already has lost a lot of memory abilities, but being able to identify people at risk, like we do it with heart disease and treat them much, much earlier. I have no doubt that ultimately treatments will allow us to think very differently about mental illness as being tied to biological processes in the brain. Having said that, for schizophrenia, for example, we have not really seen the breakthrough that we would like to see. We have spent a good amount of time, and that means more than 100 years. We do have good treatments to manage acute episodes, crises, that often need an intervention, sometimes even against the will of the person. So we are doing okay with a short period of time, like we can win one battle, but we have to really think about the entire war that we are trying to fight against an illness that can be very, very uh, disruptive for the person's life and potentially lead to the person's ending their life. 15% of individuals with schizophrenia end their life. And so it's really important that we understand that while treatments will help and will be developed, at this point, we are at a very early stage. 
Um, we do see some new interventions. We do, in addition to medication, see neuromodulation. Um, and that is really changing the activity of the brain, either through electrical currents or magnetic fields. We see that as a new opportunity. It's also helpful for substance, in use, substance use. It's quite important to know. So there are actually intersections where we can use the same treatment to treat both substance use disorders as well as illnesses like schizophrenia. And the last thing, we have learned that our medical system is highly compartmentalized. You have experts for medication, experts for psychotherapy, you have experts for reintegration into the school, finding a job. And what we have learned is we need to put them together in a team. And we need to have communications between those providers. And when that happens, the outcomes are dramatically improved. So that's kind of a, a brief snapshot of kind of, yes, treatments will change how we think about mental illness. We will develop better treatments. And we will also do better in integrating the available treatments. Yeah, and I think that's all very, very important because I think it's important for people to realize that people, as you mentioned, have been working on trying to understand these diseases and treatments for years. I heard, um, this is anecdotal, but during the time of COVID, we were very fortunate in that um, vaccines came around quickly. And... Um, I heard on the radio one day where people were talking about this and saying, well, when are they going to put this effort into curing Alzheimer's or yeah. curing, you know, drug abuse, addiction? And the reality of it is people have been working on these questions for a long time and have been very, very focused on it. But the brain is incredibly complex. And a lot of times we don't understand. There's probably many different ways that you can, you know, it's not one size fits all as a disease. It's very heterogeneous. There's many different moving parts. Um, as you continue your treatment, Lainey, can you tell us a little bit about what is the advice you give to someone that you meet that's really trying to figure out what the next steps are? You know, I'm here and, um, you know, I, I don't know what to do. What is sort of the hope and the message that you give to people? Um, I tell people, find your tribe. Um, it's very important um, to have people around you want to hold you accountable as soon as you get out of treatment. Um, I really feel like the real test is when you get out of treatment, you're back into the world, you're back into some people still have triggers when they get out of treatment. So my advice is always find your people, find your tribe. Um, like I said, the accountability thing is really huge because for so long, the way we think is it's messed up, right? Like the decisions that I made in the past, it got me to where I was. So I find like a sponsor, some uh, find like a spiritual mentor, either route and not one route is going to be the same. There's so many different ways to get to recovery, whether it be um, through treatment, whether it be through your local church. I mean, there's many, many options, but having that person to, um, you know, guide you to make decisions on your life so early on when your like brain is still hitting all the the waves trying to rewire itself. Um, so that would be my biggest advice is find somebody that you trust, find somebody that can give you solid ground advice um, when you're walking back in life. Oh, that's really good advice. Kristen, how about you? From the educational perspective, you're talking to students, you're talking to teens. Um, what resonates with them? What do you find that, you know, really can start a discussion? Because often teens may not be the most open, and I say this as having teenagers, the most open at times to wanting to hear, you know, what to do or, you know, trying to figure out what to do next. So what is your advice? What do you say? That's a great question. I have found that really treating teens and young adults, um, like they can completely understand this, not, not speaking down to them, not any condescension when I'm delivering the information, giving them scientific, factual, you know, research that's out there and saying, look, I'm, I'm giving you this, this research and this data that's out there, but I'm giving it to you not to scare you. Cause sometimes when you're, when you're talking about overdose, you're talking about, you know, drug induced schizophrenia, things like that. It can be very frightening. Um, but really trying to have a more uh, a non-fear based approach and more knowledge based approach to them and tell them I'm giving you this because I know that you can understand it and 
you can try and um, you know make make sense of it. And even though your prefrontal cortex is not fully online, I know that you can get this. And you know in your gut, you know you know in your gut when something you're doing is not right. And um, just just to try and tell them that you can make good decisions, even though your prefrontal cortex is not fully online, you can definitely make good decisions and treating them with respect, treating them with ultimate respect, whether whatever they're going through in life. Yeah, no, I think that's really good. Stefan, you made a comment before, and um, you know, we know that depression, schizophrenia, bipolar disease, these are mental illnesses, but there is they're, they're brain-based diseases in that something has gone wrong. It's not um, a problem of willpower. These are real medical conditions, but they also involve the body. We know, for example, sleep is very important. Stress can often throw things off. Can you talk a little bit about, um, you know, advice you would give? And again, my questions to you have been more general, allowing you to kind of drill down a little bit, but really the overall well-being that promotes good mental health. Yeah. So most of the time um, that I spend in clinical practices with adolescents and young adults who have the first bout of a psychotic illness, um, so they are typically struggling to the degree that they're brought to the attention of a physician and they're being asked to look at them for treatment that includes medication. And medication is often very helpful, again, in the acute episode. Sometimes it requires hospitalization of the person. Um, and my recommendations always are that they should stay on the medication for a while because it helps them to prevent another episode. It's very similar to somebody being uh, diagnosed with a physical illness and then being told that they need to stay on a particular medication so that they prevent further episodes. So that's one. The second is that it is absolutely crucial for the person to make sense of what happened to them. A young person who ends up with a psychiatrist wants to know why that happened. They are not just going along and taking the medication because the doctor says so. They would like to know, do they really need it? Is what they're experiencing really that difficult to accept? Um, do I really even have to see the doctor? So to find a counselor, to find a community that actually helps them make sense of it is absolutely, absolutely crucial. And lastly, once they have tackled those two, engaging with treatment, whether it's medication or other kinds of intervention, making sense of what happened to them, they need to find purpose for well-being, for having mental wellness as an adult or as an adolescent, it requires the person to know where they want to go. So the, the metaphor that I often use is we might help them restart the engine, but they are in the driver's seat. They need to decide where they want to go. And there's no map. There's no medication for the map of where they want to go. It's up to them. That's a daunting task. Now, if they don't get the jump start, they will never get there in the first place. But we should not forget that once we've done our part with medication and counseling, it ultimately is the young person who defines what's meaningful to them. And that will save them. And that ultimately will give them the mental wellness they're looking for. Thank you. Lainey, how does that re resonate with you? I love it. Everything you just said, um, especially the purpose thing. Like I said earlier, uh, find a purpose till it finds you. And just the... Um, it really is up to the person to want to um, drive the cart, as you said, like we can give, um, you can give me all the tools in the world, all the, um, everything to, for, you can equip me with something really great, but until I put that into action, nothing is going to change. So I really love uh, what you said. Um, Kristen. I briefly wanted to come back. We mentioned your documentary, and um, I know we have a couple of questions in the chat, and it's been put in, but um, your documentary, Speaking Through Me, is, which is a trailer right now, but is actually going to be shown as a documentary. Can you again remind us of the dates and times, and then will this be shown other than Franklin, Tennessee, or um, what are the plans for this, where more people can actually learn about um, your educational outreach and really where to find this? level of um, engagement and education. Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to share. 
so again, it's August 15th, uh, Tuesday night, 7 p.m. at the Franklin Theater in Franklin, Tennessee. And um, as far as uh, the documentary going out, uh, we, it was accepted and selected um, to screen at the Tarzana International Film Festival. We just heard back from one and it, it's, it won a semi-final category, so uh, award for short form documentary. And we've submitted to several other um, film festivals and we're waiting to hear about that. But that gives me such hope, you know, that, that um, a lot of people who have seen it says this is so needed right now because it not only touches on addiction, it talks it mainly touches on mental health and um, and ha how it leads to self harm or addiction, things like that. But um, but as far as schools go, we are trying to get it into schools, and we've already have um, some some steps into schools here in Tennessee. Um, but what we're hoping is that we're building an entire program right now that we want to make available for teachers because teachers are overworked right now and to give them a, a way that they can actually show the documentary and we're making little teaching videos on the adolescent brain using a lot of levity here so kids will really like them, you know, <laughs> but, but where teachers can show them in the classroom and it goes with uh, assignments as well and that parents can see. So we're, we're making it an entire website that will be accessible by all eventually. Well, congratulations. Um, it's, uh, we're so happy and so proud of you because this is such a wonderful effort. Um, what other outreach efforts are you doing? I know we're based here in Tennessee, um, but what other efforts are you doing? Because I do think that um, what we talked about, it can be difficult to find treatment but often people also want to engage in sort of the outreach of learning more. Maybe they're not to the treatment or maybe just as a parent wanting to know what other resources are out there. So can you tell us a little bit more of what um, you are doing around here? So around in Tennessee, I, it basically has been a, a word of mouth type of thing where I've been speaking in recovery centers. I've been speaking in um, many schools um, and uh, we're partnered now with all 58 uh, public schools, Metro Nashville public schools, and uh, through a thing called Family U University or an organization who's wonderful, just trying to put cohesiveness back in the family unit. And um, also with law enforcement, I have given plenty of uh, seminars with law enforcement and, and just really reaching out to everyone and hoping that um, they will learn something, come to the website and be able to uh, have it at their fingertips, whatever they want to learn about and can reach out. And we, we are here, we are here and we want to share. <laughs> but you know, if, we, if you can help one person, that's what it is. If you can touch one person's life, that, that makes it all worth it. So, and in my son's name, so, which is beautiful. Absolutely. Um, we have a question um, that's come up a couple of times in the registration as well as um, in the chat. And I'm really, um, I, I'm hoping, Stefan, you would be willing to answer this for us because I think it's an important question in that, you know, people have asked hereditary role in terms of mental disorders. And we know, again, often as I've asked the question, I've spoken in very broad terms to allow you to go in different directions with it. And there's different um, heritable risk depending on the disorder, just like there are for other disorders outside of the brain. But can you talk a little bit about that as well as in role of environment? Because we don't want people to feel that just because they may suffer from depression, they've necessarily passed it on and creating more angst and guilt, but yet the realistic way of how clinicians really think about this. Yeah, so in a nutshell, Genes are not our fate. Genes will make us more vulnerable to develop a particular illness, but there still is a significant opportunity for us to intervene and prevent the evolution of the illness, particularly when it comes to mental illness. Now, there are some genetic conditions where the ability of the brain to function is impaired from day one. That's not what we are talking about. We are not talking about the neurodevelopmental abnormalities that make it difficult for the person to walk or to speak. 
there are quite a number of those conditions, but that's not what we are talking. We are talking about much more subtle changes that will only develop later on in life, sometimes in adolescence, sometimes in adulthood. And we've learned that illnesses such as bipolar disorder or schizophrenia do have a significant genetic risk. So if a person knows that it runs in the family and either siblings or parents or even grandparents, uncles, have been diagnosed and have experienced those illnesses, then the person knows that they are also at greater risk. That doesn't mean that it's going to happen. It simply means the risk, let's say, the risk for schizophrenia for all of us, all of us on this call, is close to 1%, a little bit less than 1%. But if you know that you have a family member, it increases several fold. If you then on top of that also start using marijuana very early on in life, before age 13, it increases several fold more. If you then also are exposed to very stressful life events, it increases even further. So scientists actually have developed these so-called risk calculators. They're even available on a website and you can go in and enter a couple of data points and see under those conditions, what is the risk of developing schizophrenia? And so we have learned that risks are sometimes given to us by our family members. And sometimes they are given to us by society. If you live in a war zone, the risk for many mental illnesses is dramatically increased. If you live in poverty, you will have a substantially greater risk for many mental illnesses. So we have learned over the years that the combination of genetic risk and environmental risk determines the likelihood of a person to experience the illness. And that should not be given as kind of the final word, but rather as an opportunity to then change lifestyle. So if you know that you're at greater risk, it would be better off to have a profession and have a community around you that can be supportive rather than exposing yourself to the most demanding job, doing it all on your own. So those are kind of the, the recommendations that we would make. We should never consider the genes to be the fate. They do, however, constrain us and they limit our choices, but we still have a lot of opportunities to find our purpose. And as you said, in many ways, it provides hope. It provides an opportunity by having this information to look forward. That's and I fine. think that's important. Lainey, we're coming close to the hour and I wanted to kind of get your final thoughts um, really uh, before we end this session. Moving forward, you've had a tremendous journey. You're doing phenomenally well. And we're so happy you're providing your wisdom. So any final thoughts from you on really, you know, what you would like to share with the audience as well as sort of your journey? Yeah, I would say, um, I, again, thank you guys for having me here. This has been wonderful. Um, just to get to be on the, the panel with you guys has been amazing. Um, but yeah, my journey was definitely tough. Um, you know, I started using at the age I was like, a, I believe like, 13 or 14, and it turned into a really long um, heroin battle, uh, fitting all towards the end. But I would say um, that my hope, I would want to leave them with hope. Like, yes, it can be really, really bad, um, but there is light at the end of the tunnel. There are resources. There are people out there that are willing to hold your hand and walk with you through it. Um, and don't let the the guilt and the shame that, that does pile on um, the you know, the stigma, stigma around mental health, um, addiction, just don't let that hold, um, hold you like captured, be willing to speak about it, be willing to get vulnerable with somebody and seek resources. Um, Cause there are people out there that are willing to walk with you through it. And the purpose thing. I love that. <laughs> Thank you so much. How about you, Kristen? You know, I would uh, just that, you know, there is hope. There is hope. There are people out there who can help you. There, there truly is. And you just, if you, you just got to keep searching and uh, find a community, find a supportive community around you and uh, also practice some self-compassion too. <laughs> As we're talking about hope, um, Stefan, um, I'd like to get, again, as, a, as the chair of psychiatry here at Vanderbilt, as a psychiatrist, 
Um, hope is such an important thing, but also just get your final thoughts on if you are a parent and you have real concerns, really, um, you know, finding the right way, how would you connect to someone? We touched upon this briefly, like it can be hard to navigate. There can be some opportunities, but for someone out there listening to this session and saying, okay, what do I need to do? I need to really do something. I need to make a call. What would your advice be very broadly? And again, it depends on the type of illness. I realize that, but for someone just trying to find a starting point, because it can just be so overwhelming. Yeah. So again, it gets me back to those three different pieces, engagement, uh, starting the treatment with therapy, counseling, and then if need be also taking medication, but it has to be in that sequence. I cannot tell you how often I get a call from a parent and say they would like to make an appointment for their teenager. The teenager has to be the person asking for the appointment, not the parent. Now, the parent can facilitate it. They can help with making the appointment, take care of the finances and all of that. But it ultimately has to be the person willing to come on their own. That is absolutely crucial. So again, engagement at the end is, is the most important one. It's often not there in the beginning. It often takes many trials, many frustrations, many attempts. Do not give up. Once you reach the person and you have the person engaged, which is they have found purpose and meaning in treatment, they will come. That is the most important end goal, not the one intervention that will only be done for a couple of weeks and then people will go back to the usual. And I think that's really important because obviously we're all wanting to have what's best for our children, for our nieces, for our nephews, for our community. And so with that, we're going to end the session on team well-being. I'd like to thank you all for being here. I'd like to give a th special thanks to Lainey for coming in and telling her story. For Kristen, we wish you more continued to su success on your wonderful documentary, which again, August 15th in Franklin, Tennessee at 7 p.m. It's going to be shown. And again, it's called Speaking Through Me. And I'd also like to thank Stefan Hackers, the Chair of Psychiatry at Vanderbilt University Medical Center for all of your advice and from really the psychiatry's perspective. Again, this has been sponsored by the Vanderbilt University School of Medicine. I'm Lisa Monteja, and thank you for joining us. Goodbye. Bye, guys. Bye-bye.